Hello and welcome to this event, How Can We Reform the House of Lords? As you may have noticed, I'm not Hannah White. Um, she has been defeated by snow-related travel disruption, uh, but I am Jess Sargent, uh, Senior Researcher at the Institute for Government. Um, and I am leading the review of the UK Constitution, a collaboration between the Institute for Government and the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at Cambridge. Um, and this event forms part of that project. Uh, so reform of the House of Lords is very much back on the agenda. Controversy over the Prime Minister's resignation honours and recent lobbying scandals have reignited calls to urgently reform the appointments process. And Labour want to go further. They've announced plans to replace the second chamber with an elected assembly of nations and regions, informed by proposals put forward by Gordon Brown's Constitutional Commission. But Lords reform is notoriously difficult and many governments have tried and failed before. In this event, we'll explore what changes to the House of Lords are necessary, how or can they be implemented, and what impact reform of the Second Chamber could have on the operation of the rest of the UK Constitution. Joining me now to discuss all this and more, I have an excellent panel. Matthew Hannay is a former Special Advisor to Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg. Darren Hughes is Chief Executive of the Electoral Reform Society. Lord Norton of Louth is a Conservative peer and Professor of Government at the University of Hull. And Sarah Sackman is a Labour candidate for Finchley and Golders Green and a Commissioner on Gordon Brown's Commission on the Future of the UK. We'll be taking questions both from our in-person audience and also online. You can send them in via Slido. Um, you can find that using the hashtag IFG Lords Reform. We'll also have a microphone um, coming round later and we'll be live tweeting from at IFG events. So please do tweet along using the same hashtag, hashtag IFG Lords Reform. Great, so let's get started. And let's start with the problem here. I'll come to you first, Matthew. What's wrong with the House of Lords? Uh, well, let me start by saying there is a lot white with the House of Lords, and I'm not just saying that because of the, my distinguished co-panellist. Uh, you know, I think, and I, I would expect everyone in this room knows what the Lords does well, but just to recap, you know, lots of effective scrutiny, lots of effective committee work, lots of expertise. So it is important, even, thus, even for those of us who are extremely pro-reform, to be clear, there are a lot of good things in the Lords. What's wrong? It's too big. Everyone knows this. Um, it's not represented to the country as the Brown Commission, I hope I'm allowed to call it that as a shorthand, <laughs> identified, you know, it's not regionally balanced, it's not demographically balanced, doesn't look, sound, feel like modern Britain. So those are the things that, you know, are obvious problems. Um, and then for me, and I assume I'm not alone on this, again, the view of the Brown Commission, ultimately, what's wrong with it? It's not democratic. Yeah, we all know how people have got there. In the case of 90 of them, literally who their parents were, the rest of them, how they butted up prime ministers or party leaders um, in various different ways over the years. And then just one observation. In your introduction, you said there being controversy over the prime minister's resignation list. Which one? Yeah, <laughs> We've got two prime ministers and two resignation lists over which there's a potential controversy in one year, which kind of speaks, I would say, to the problem. Absolutely. Um, Lord Norton, you've been a peer for only over 20 years. Um, would you agree with Matthew's analysis there? Uh, well, uh, in part. Um, it's identified some of the problems and then created those that aren't actually uh, uh, problems. I mean, the bit about appointments, most peers are there because of their experience and their expertise. Those that are there because they're donors or cronies. Um, are a very small proportion of the total, but of course people generalise from an N of one or two, you just need a few, and people think that characterises the whole institution. It doesn't, and it's that experience and expertise that makes the Lords distinctive and what adds value to our political process. So we need to protect that, but while addressing some of the problems that have quite rightly been uh, identified. One is size, and the other is the appointments process itself to maintain the benefits of getting a certain type of person that will add to the second chamber, making it qualitatively distinctive. So we do need to address size. The House of Lords accept it's too big. We passed a motion unanimously saying we're too big. Steps should be taken to reduce our size. There's overwhelmingly support for uh, reforming the appointments process. So I've got, as you touched on, I've got a private member's bill uh, before the House at the moment, overwhelmingly supported on second reading to introduce uh, changes to the Appointments Commission, making it statutory, protecting its independence, uh, injecting high quality threshold for 
nominees, injecting transparency on the part of party leaders in making nominations, and in requiring the Prime Minister to have regard to certain principles, uh, including reducing the size of the House so it's no bigger than the House of Commons, ensuring no party has an absolute majority, which I think is absolutely crucial uh, to the work of their House, which probably be lost if you start to change it uh, substantially, and making sure that at least 20% of the members are cross-bench peers, in other words, independents who have no party political affiliation, which again adds value in a way that an elected a chamber of um, politicians or representing parties would not do. Thank you. Um, so, Darren, there's a kind of tension here between uh, an un unelected chamber, which some people will argue isn't, um, sorry, which isn't democratic, um, but then an appointed chamber which bring in, brings in uh, expertise. Where do the public stand on this? Well, I think, I mean, I do echo what has been said uh, uh, earlier about the fact that, of course, with any institution, you can always point to things about it that, that have, have value. And if you're looking to reform, you'd say, well, how do you pick up the best things of that and transport it in, in, into a new environment? And I, I guess the principle that we would uh, start on is that if you're going to help to write the laws of the land, you should be chosen by the people of the country. So that would, that would make it a, one of the distinctive principles, I guess, where there'll be disagreement about, uh, about whether or not that's a, a valid one, but that's certainly where we would say. Uh, the survey work that's been done on what people think about the House of Lords has shown for quite a long time now that the biggest group of voters do think that if it's, there's going to be a second chamber, it should be uh, elected by the public. And the most recent, uh, there's the YouGov tracker work, but there's also um, some of the work that we've done that only 6% of people, when you say, look, here's the way it's constituted now, do you support this, uh, go along with it. So I think that there is, there's, uh, there's a high level of knowledge of the institution amongst a tiny group of people. They tend to be the people who comment on it. Uh, but but when, it's, uh, when, when it's sort of put, it, put out there to say, how should the democratic setup be, then, then it does come back looking for, uh, looking for change. And I think when you zoom out a little wider than that and say, what are some of the issues that are driving you know, uh, uh, trust, accessibility, participation, etc.? Um, having such a large chamber of, of, of people who have been appointed because of either connections or birth or church affiliation, etc., I think we're now in a situation where the, the upsides of the status quo are now so overwhelmingly drowned by the deficiencies and the neg negativities of it that it's just not, not enough to say, well, no one really cares, let's do one or two things of tinkering and hope the whole debate moves on. I think we've kind of, feels to me as though we've gone past that point, and that was even before the release of last week's report. Thank you. So public support potentially for reform, but how much of a priority is it for voters, Sarah, if a new Labour government were to be elected, they'd have a lot to deal with, cost of living crisis, the economy, why should House of Lords reform be a priority? Is that what the public really are calling for? Well, I was at the launch of the report last week in Leeds, and that was exactly the question that was being put to both Gordon Brown and Keir Starmer. We're living in a cost of living crisis. People are worried about their energy bills. Why are you talking about House of Lords reform? And actually, if you read the whole report and set it in its context, the report is about unleashing the economic potential of this country. The proposals that we put forward and recommend for House of Lords reform are made in a context of 39 other recommendations which relate to the wholesale radical political and economic reform of this country, which primarily involves a radical proposal for devolution of power away from Westminster and Whitehall into the regions and nations. So you've got to set it in its context. And in terms of whether it's a political priority, I think has already been suggested, there is substantial majority support for reform of the House of Lords. We saw in the debates around Brexit this idea that people felt alienated from their democratic institutions, from, political, from the political process. The mantra of taking back control, putting power in the hands of people is a very, very powerful one. And it's in that context that the proposals for reform of the House of Lords are being made. I would add to what's already been said that House of Lords reform, or the House of Lords in its present form, is indefensible in principle. When you look at the idea that 92 hereditary peers who are there solely by virtue of birth are making the lords of the, this land, the public looks at that and says, blimey. We look at the fact that the size of the House of Lords makes it the second largest second chamber after only 
the uh, second chamber in the Communist Republic of China. That's how bloated it is, coupled with the fact that it doesn't represent the regions and nations of this country. It predominantly is composed from those from the southeast and from London. And, and finally, in the debates we were having, it, I, I think it is um, telling that the report has landed in amongst the debates we're having about the latest uh, appointments, uh, about the scandal around PPE uh, and Michelle Moan. The fact that you have the Sunday Times reporting uh, a former Conservative Party chairman saying that once you pay your three million, you get your peerage. The public looks at that and says, yes, of course I'm worried about the cost of living, but I'm also worried and doubting that these things are ever going to be fixed. And this is not just about one party or another. There is consensus across the political piece that people look at our political institutions and the trust simply isn't there. And the polling that underpins our recommendation is one which shows substantial majority support above 70% of support for substantial reform of the House of Lords. Uh, so we say that the two things are interconnected because we're not going to get the sort of long-term uh, economic and political reform that we need unless we start tackling these, uh, these issues. So Matthew, you were part of a government that expended a lot of time and political capital you know, trying to reform the House of Lords um, and, and the proposals didn't ultimately go through. What would be your advice to uh, a future government attempting to do the same? Uh, well, I, and I think this will, we will see, but make it crystal clear in the manifesto, the proposal, also the, the democratic mandate is unarguable, um, and then be utterly ruthless about prioritisation of political capital in it. So you say you're expending political capital, one half or whatever percentage of the coalition you think the Liberal Democrats were, were the ones expending political capital. Ultimately, David Cameron didn't go to the floor on this, um, quite possibly correctly from his point of view, why would he? Um, so I think you know it has to be something that is a clear priority. And then I think also, as has just been very eloquently done, it has to be tied into um, you know, a wider reform package um, of constitutional reform. Of course, from my perspective, what's slightly disappointing about the report is it doesn't really consider the questions of the first chamber, and I think these are interlinked. But nonetheless, I think if you're going to land the case for Lords of Form or a second chamber reform, tying it into more radical devolution, thinking about what you do with the nations, I think obviously perhaps most importantly Scotland, but the others as well. Um, you know, I think those are incredibly important. But ultimately, it's about political capital. And we've seen the, perhaps backlash is slightly too strong, but you know, backlash from Labour members of the House of Lords um, uh, to this report. So I think if you want to make it work, you have to be, be crystal clear that this is something that you are going to prioritise, you're going to put your political capital on. Probably you need to have a strong minister in charge of driving it if you're in government as well, who is clearly seen as kind of trusted by the prime minister. Obviously, by definition, in the coalition, you know, arguably that was one mistake we we made that you know you need to have a conservative front it perhaps if you want to get it through in that context. Um, so I think you know a, a strong and empowered ally of, for assuming Keir Starmer as prime minister would be another thing. But you know, it's not for me. <laughs> uh, I can tell you the mistakes <laughs> we made. Um, uh, uh, what I would just say, one final one, is don't worry about getting cross-party consensus, yeah? It, it, it's a nightmare, <laughs> you know? People can never agree, and this is how it stayed as it is. You can't get agreement on how to reform the House of Lords. Everyone has their own different version of it, yeah? Uh, and all of them, you know, we can all probably agree on getting hereditary by-elections, yeah? We can probably do that, but beyond that, you can't get consensus. So I'd just say, do it, yeah? <laughs> I might say tinker with this, my colleagues might say this, Lord Dan Crackman's the House of Lords might say that. You've just got to do it, yeah? And arguably that's what Blair did, of course, in, yeah. in the, the reforms that were done. Well, thank you. Um, Darren, considering some of the challenges of House, Re House of Lords reform, both getting the legislation through and on getting agreement, a lot of people would argue that you need to try and do what you can in, in the meantime, something that looks perhaps a little bit like um, the proposals that Lord Norton has put out in his private members bill. Do you think that's the approach that a uh, future reformist government should take, or does actually making the House of Lords more acceptable make it more difficult for, for that whole scale reform? Well, m maybe because it's Christmas, we should have both. Um, <laughs> uh, that, that, that there's, no, there's no harm in taking on some smaller reforms uh, in, in the meantime, but you've got to keep the eye on the, on the big prize. And I think, you know, as has just been, just been alluded to, uh, the, these kind of changes where you're effectively asking an industry to rearrange itself, 
and you've got lots of people who are involved in it, know it intimately, people who are adjacent to it would like to be in it. There's, there's lots of things that, are, that, that drive uh, the desire to see that reform that has death of a thousand cuts. So people will say, yes, I'm worried about the number of political appointments, and then there are very few political retirements, but if a vehicle exists for retirement, this is seen as a, a major victory. So I think we've got to be careful that these are not deflections. You know, there is a serious principled problem here that needs reform. Uh, in the meantime, there are some very good initiatives, and we've got the author of, of one here, uh, and, and, I, and I know that there are others as well around the, around the hereditaries, but I think that sometimes these things are uh, proposed by people who do see the need for change and want to make that happen, but then some of the fellow travellers that come on board is, well, this is a great long grass exercise as well. So I think, you know, the, as I sort of indicated at the beginning, I think, struck by the reaction to the report last week, to the resignation of the Johnson proposals, uh, which, you know, well over half the country don't think he should be uh, creating uh, new peerages as part of his resignation. We, we, we haven't uh, polled on what people think about Liz Truss's uh, uh, waste to employ, because I don't think <laughs> there's any doubt about the result of the outcome of that survey work. Um, but, but I think while those things are taking place and happening, uh, you, you've got to be um, sticking on the, on the major reform that's required to make the, the principled case for the fact that the Constitution does need changing and repairing and, and healing and not just think, well, if we can just distract everyone for a while, things will carry on. And the example on that, you know, Lord Burns did a lot of great work trying to get uh, uh, reducing of the number, and that survived for precisely one Prime Minister. I mean, and Mrs May deserves a lot of credit for the fact she exercised, you know, more or less, quite a lot of restraint in the appointments, and then with the change of one Prime Minister to the next one, that went right out the window. And depending on how outrageous uh, Mr Johnson's list is, he'll be responsible for the appointment in that three tumultuous years of over 100 peers. So I think this argument that if we tidy the house up ourselves, chaps, it'll all be okay, just doesn't really st stand the test of time. And you know, some of the Blair reforms are still hanging over 25 years later. So I think it does need the big movement. Um, and, uh, but in the meantime, there are some initiatives in the next couple of years that could be pursued that are, that are quite wise. Thank you. Um, Lord Norton, we've talked quite a lot about Labour's plans for reform if, if they were to win the next election, but where do you think the current government stands on this? Are they interested in, in making some of those changes and do we expect Rishi Sunak to take a very different approach to, to Boris Johnson in terms of the, the number of appointments? The previous Conservative manifesto made it <coughs> clear that the, the government recognises that um, there's a case for reform of the laws, but it's a value in terms of what it adds to the political process. So I'm not sure the government would be interested in sort of the, the sort of big bang reform because of the sort of problems that would be entailed, as we've seen before. Because don't forget the Parliament Number 2, Bill 969, House of Lords Reform Bill 2012, died in the House of Commons. That's where the problem lay. Achieving incremental reform... Um, is achievable. So the government in 2019 took credit for the 2014 House of Lords Reform Act, which was actually got through as a private member's bill. The government just facilitated it. And that demonstrated that you can achieve change, incremental uh, change. So we got the 2014 Act on the statute book, allowing peers to retire, getting rid of any peer who commits a serious criminal offence, getting rid of any peer... Uh, who doesn't attend for a session. Since we got that act on the statute book, the number of peers leaving is, runs into three figures. Next year, we got the 2015 House of Lords Suspe uh, Expulsion and Suspension Act enacted. So incremental reform is uh, both desirable and achievable. So we can make some strides um, in a, an environment where there are so many pressing demands for change. And just on the point about public opinion, I just make the point, it depends on how you ask the question. Um, there was a survey some years ago, and one of the questions was along the lines of, in order to ensure democratic legitimacy, should not most members of the House of Lords be elected? Oh, yes. So something like 74% said yes. A later question said, to ensure that there's thorough scrutiny by experts, should most members of the House of Lords be appointed? Oh, yeah, 76% said yes, and that was in the same poll. So um, views aren't that deep on the subject, and it depends how you phrase the question. So, and that that's, um, point is, I think, very important to the more normative question of what you expect of the check and chamber, what value it adds to uh, uh, the process. I mean, it's up to us, uh, those who take my view, to go out and explain what value is added and the danger of what would be lost if you went to change which would get rid of all the benefits of the benefits we see 
we should address the problems, because there are problems, we accept that, they need to be addressed. But if you go for Big Bang reform, you lose the benefits and don't actually add uh, a second chamber that contributes to the system in the way that the present second chamber does. The danger is creating something that either duplicates or conflicts without any substantial added value. And the second chamber that quite rightly would probably demand more powers than the existing chamber, would make use of the existing powers, which we don't, um, in a way that uh, would create problems for the system without having the benefits, the value added, we get from asymmetrical uh, bicameralism rather than moving towards what's been advocated. Sarah, how would you uh, respond to that? I mean, uh, one of the arguments that's made in, in favour of the current House of Lords is that expertise and that detailed scrutiny work, which I think is, is quite necessary in some circumstances. There's less interest in the House of Commons to look at things like delegated legislation or the, the boring things as such. How would your proposals aim to maintain that with a new elected chamber? So look, I, I, I think to the point about incremental reform, I think it was the People's Budget of 1909 that, that talked about House of Lords reform as a temporary measure and, and floated the idea of an elected second chamber. And if you want to talk about an incremental reform, you'd look at where we are some hundred years later. I, we, we, we could, on that basis, I think, be waiting a, a very long time. But, 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 but to answer your question and, 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 and to your point, we quite agree, and the report acknowledges the um, constructive function that the House of Lords currently performs in terms of scrutinising uh, government legislation, government policy. And we, in terms of defining what we say ought to be the, the functions and purposes of, House, of the House of Lords or a new second chamber, and it's really important to define those functions and purposes before you decide exactly what sort of new uh, entity you want to uh, you want to want to construct. We're very very clear that that function of constructive scrutiny of legislation, the sort of important work that's done uh, in committee, is retained, and that is seen as very much part of what the House of Lords or a new second chamber is there to do. But but we say it needs to do much more. Um, there, there are three further functions. That the, the report underlines. Secondly, the bringing together of the regions and nations. We've talked about geographical composition already, but it's really important that not just that a second chamber is representative of the regions and nations, but it sees itself in terms of its functions as bringing those voices uh, to the very centre of government. Thirdly, monitoring adherence to standards in public life, which um, we, we see has become again vitally important as we come out of several tumultuous years uh, under uh, the, the, the Johnson government in particular. And fourthly, perhaps the most important function or the most important recommendation in our report is this new function whereby the second chamber becomes a safeguard of the constitution and in particular to the distribution of uh, powers within the United Kingdom. Um, and, and I think if we're very clear and this is to answer your question directly, if we're very clear about what the functions of a second chamber are, if those are tightly and precisely drawn, then even with a proposal to democratically elect the members of that second chamber, it's very clear what you're electing people to do and what their functions are. And we believe that with that, not only do you get the democratic legitimacy, which certainly uh, three of us and uh, maybe all of us on the panel are, are arguing to some extent, but you will retain um, the best of what the House of Lords currently does in a reformed second chamber with these new functions. So one of the things some people might be concerned about is that uh, you might lose some of the independence of the House of Lords in, in reform, for example, through the crossbench peers who don't have party affiliation. How would you guard against the risk that a new, a new second chamber with this constitutional role was not just controlled by uh, political party whips and therefore able to kind of uh, just wave things through as, as is often a criticism of, of the House of Commons? I mean, I think, you know, again, recognising, acknowledging the good work that crossbench peers do, if we thought that the current system was providing, if coming out of the 
uh, debacle around prorogation, the running roughshod over our constitutional conventions over the last few years, if we thought that things were working so well under the current system and that the current House of Lords was actually providing the sort of constitutional safeguards that I think we all want to see, then um, I, 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 I perhaps would accept that, 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 that argument as a reason for um, why we should retain the status quo. Um, but I think the fact that what we put forward carefully proposes electing the second chamber on a different cycle, that accountability to the regions and nations from which um, uh, new members of a second chamber, a second chamber which, by the way, we say should be much smaller, much leaner, 200 members is what we're proposing, much more in line with second chambers that you see uh, around the world. Um, that accountability plus a um, codified and carefully drawn set of functions means that actually, given the legitimacy and where it's drawn from, coupled with those functions and the, if you like, loyalty or duty to safeguard the constitution, that's the primary duty of these new members, not party, country before party, let's put it that way. Thank you. Um, Matthew, I wanted to, to come to you on this. I mean, one of the big concerns about um, <coughs> electing the second chamber is that it might uh, challenge the primacy of the House of Commons. Um, is that something that you thought about when developing uh, proposals in, in the coalition? And is it a risk we need to guard, guard against or is it potentially a, a benefit? Well, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that the current House of Lords will, on occasion, challenge the primacy. Uh, admittedly only recently on fox hunting and age of consent which perhaps says something about the current composition of the house of lords so you know it's not unheard of um it does happen just rather some might say esoteric choices um so that's first thing but, but secondly yeah we did look at this very carefully in, in the coalition and i think lots of this com comes back to the the previous question on the sort of how do you keep the elements of independence and and sort of less strong partisan dynamics so you can have you know single terms longer terms not up, you know, not up for re-election. Um, this this would at least potentially encourage or engender. Um, but you know, you can do as, and, and I think the Brown Commission outlined it quite carefully. You can have a clearly delineated set of powers that the second chamber has that are either you can keep the current ones, you can tweak them as has been proposed, you could increase them somewhat, but still keep them delineated. Um, but look, the House of Commons has. No problem currently, some of us might say far too little problem in riding roughshod over local democracy. Um, you know, there's lots of um, places, lots of other elements of democracy in the United Kingdom, including the, you know, the devolved administrations, where, you know, you've got quite clear kind of separation where the House of Commons primacy, ultimately, because, you know, we do not, it's not federal, it's devolved, remains. Uh, you know, I don't think you need to be too concerned about a risk of uh, sort of, you know, the Lords becoming uh, too, too strong or too powerful. But, you know, ultimately, if there is, um, you know, some increased test of, you know, the Commons legitimacy and the government's legitimacy, probably for people like me, at least until we have a uh, change in electoral reform in the first chamber, that's no bad thing. You know, if you have a Lords that's able to say, well, actually, because we've got a different electoral system, We've got a, you know, a cross-party majority here that is asking a single-party government that does not have a majority of the electorate supporting it in, its, in a general election to think again for another year, so using existing powers. I think that's the worst thing in the world. Obviously, you've got the existing carves out, which I personally would keep on you know, money bills, that kind of thing. Um, so I think look, there's a balance to be struck. Um, I think the other point I make is there are lots of other countries, and everyone in this room is familiar with them, I'm sure, where this works, where you can have a subordinate, second chamber, asymmetric system, Bundesrat, if you're going for a sort of, you know, nations and regions type model. It's not beyond the wit of man, you know. We have a bad habit in this country to think that it's UK or US, and those are the only two political systems. And yes, if you have the powers that the Senate does, then you can get logjam. There's lots of continental systems in different ways, um, and, and indeed Commonwealth systems, where you have second chambers that are, you know, able to exercise, I would say, what probably most of us want to see from the House of Lords, you know, check, test, forced, forced revision sometimes, but not ultimately a kind of a parity rival.
Thank you. Um, Lord Norton, I just wanted to come to you next. I mean, we're talking about quite fundamental changes mm. to how the constitution operates, both in the composition of parliament and this, this new role to potentially block legislation uh, that relates to certain parts of certain constitutional acts. Um, is there a risk of unintended consequences? What else might change? Well, lots of unintended, well, lots of consequences that we don't perceive. And, and so we have to wait, because, um, uh, it's a bit difficult predicting um, <laughs> what they would be. I mean, but I think I could safely say the argument that if you have an elected second chamber of party politicians, that they're going to put country before party, I suspect you're going to have problems uh, with that. And I think people can see what the problems are with it. I mean, more fundamentally is the downplaying, the ignoring of the value added by the present second chamber. The focus has been on composition. Now, quite rightly, function should come first. Um, but what's been neglected is the extent to which the House of Lords does make a difference and adds value rather than challenging uh, the House of Commons. Because if you look at it, my view is that good law is a public good. And the House of Lords makes more of a difference to the detail of legislation than the House of Commons. Our statute book would be in a far worse shape now were it not for the work of the House. And the reason why people are sort of amenable to reform, they don't know much about what the House of Lords does, because amazingly, the media don't spend a lot of time focusing on the Delegated Powers Committee or the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee, looking at delegated legislation. It's not news, but it's vitally important, because the sheer volume of delegated legislation is substantial, has quite an impact. The Commons has no dedicated procedure for examining it. Um, the Lords does, and that adds value to us looking at primary legislation, because we don't go for the high-profile stuff. That is quite rightly the job of the House of Commons. The adversarial clash between parties, the great debate about the ends of legislation, which we don't challenge. We focus on the detail, not the ends. The detail's not newsworthy, but it matters, and that's what we focus on. And we've got a composition that actually enables to do that and because we're not elected, we don't need the sort of look-at-me activities that elected politicians need. So we can beaver away quietly, get on with uh, making amendments, which the government accepts, because normally they're government amendments because they've accepted the argument, therefore acceptable to the commons. So the law of this country is substantially improved as a result of the work of the Lords. So if you like an unintended consequence of Big Bang reform would be to our statute book, do you really want, well, I was going to say bad law, but certainly less good law, because you've got a second body of elected politicians looking at it from a very different perspective, who've got a political dimension to it, who are therefore being driven by that, which is looking outwards the politics of it, rather than the detail of how can we improve this legislation, how can we make it better, where is the value added in that? So, yes, I think there are unintended consequences, and they're actually quite detrimental. So we've got to think about, well, how do we protect that value-added element if you move away from the existing composition? My view is we save that, we protect that value-added element by carrying out the other reforms, which certainly in the Lords we generally accept there's a majority for getting a small, there's a majority for getting rid of the by-election option, things like that, um, for reforming the appointments process, because. You know, we're conscious that if there are a few bad appointments, it taints the whole chamber, so we, are lose, we lose out as a consequence of that. So we're very strongly in favour of changing that process. We want it all to be above board um, so that people then focus on what it is the House of Lords actually does rather than the process by which people get there, the fact everybody's always oh, second largest chamber after the people, uh, the National People's Congress of China. Um, so what? But we are too big. There are consequences that flow from that. We want to get it down. I think 200 would be uh, too small for the detailed works. Well, it's not just chamber activities. We work through specialised committees, uh, select committees, the same as the Commons. You need a substantial membership both to do that and to, you need a fairly large membership as well, um, or bigger than 200, to allow, to have the members who've got the experience and the expertise, certainly the expertise that is current, because they can still be doing, if you like, their day jobs, coming into the Lords and contributing their expertise to the discussions that are taking place. Darren, so Lord, Orn Lord Norton's arguing there that if the public 
understood the role of the House of Lords better than they might be more in favour of the current composition? How do you think that public engagement should be factored into any proposals for reform? Well, I think that's an important part to get that, that buy-in. And if we just think of last week's process as a now long consultation period that the Leader of the Opposition said that he wants to, to look at. Uh, so that will bring in, bring in more people. And I think that um, some of the use of some of the new techniques that are coming through for surveying what people think, things like citizens' assembly and deliberative models to bring out the richness of people's uh, op opinions could all be things that would help in the design of what comes next. And I think on this, on the, on this function point, um, there, there are many things to point to where there, where there is important work that happens and, and that would need to continue. It wouldn't all sort of fold the tent down and go away and say, because the, the manner in which people become members of the second chamber has changed, therefore we don't want any of that, that, that work to continue or that the, or that the new uh, uh, placeholders there would refuse to do it on the basis that their predecessor ones did it. I, I think the other point I'd make is that I think this to, uh, I think it's important not to gloss over the extent to which the composition has become the central problem. Uh, and I think that that's really got to a point now where it, it can't just be uh, glossed over or, or, or treated, with, uh, treated with minimally. Um, you know, uh, two, two thirds of members of the Lords take a party whip. Uh, if you look at the last parliament um, of those who were took a conservative whip and were regular voters, 80% uh, voted with the government. Uh, and every whipped vote was, was, was supporting the government. So I think sometimes, yes, there is some expertise, yes, there is some independence, but it has been so phenomenally overwhelmed now by everything else that that's a problem in its own right. And because the composition's become such a big issue and there's such an unwillingness to really address it in a fundamental way that's lasting, that's now drowning out the, the function part. And I, and I can't really see how that's going to get any better. That, that is only going to get worse. And so I think that we do need to be, to be looking at it. I mean, public participation includes how the chamber looks as well. I mean, if we were able to have um, a, you know, a, a voting system that came in that gave a long term, maybe even a single term, so that people didn't become campaigning politicians, as I mentioned, the, I think you said the, the look at me kind of factor. If people uh, derive their mandate democratically, but were thinking about their long-term contribution on scrutiny while they were there and not thinking about a, a long-term career of, of, of being in a second chamber, then that would, that would alter the, the, the people that would, that would stand. Some might, may have party affiliation, but if there was an STV uh, voting system, you'd also get genuine independent people who were not from party backgrounds, and voters could then look at it and say, yes, I want some people that kind of align with the party I vote for in the Commons, perhaps, but there's all these other people that are standing that have the, this, this, uh, this other range of expertise. In truth, because of this composition problem, uh, nearly a third, or just over a third, I think, of, of members of the Lords have politics as their main occupation before they got there. Now, you add in the, the, the hereditary peers, you add in the, the bishops, you know, you're now talking about a substantial proportion of the hundreds that are there. So I, I do, do think that composition point um, has now become the central one. And in terms of gender representation, you know, fewer than a third of peers are, are women. Now, I, you look at countries like my country, New Zealand, used proportional representation for a long time now. It's a 50-50 uh, parliament. That is the way the world is rightly uh, heading. And I think to, to, to stick with the, the insider model that we've got now relies on the wisdom and judgment of the revolving doors of number, number 10. And I just don't think we can put all the faith we have traditionally in that kind of model. I think it's now kind of got to a breaking point. And so I think that in bringing the public into it by, um, by letting them vote for who would be in this chamber uh, that contributes to, the, to lawmaking, but also to help with some of the design issues so that once it is explained, they can capture the good points uh, that are being made here as, as part of a new settlement. Thank you. I'll come to audience questions in a minute, so please do uh, start thinking. Um, but I'll take one from online just before I do that. Um, and I want to put this one to, to you, Sarah. Um, we talked a little bit about composition there. Obviously, a centrepiece of uh, the Brown Commission proposals is this assembly of nations and regions. How exactly should a chamber be designed to represent the nations and regions? And how might that be different from the House of Commons, who you can argue also has you know, representatives from all the nations and regions? Look, as I said right at the start, this whole proposal that we put forward is made in the, in the context of really a whole new um, articulation of the mission of the UK. What's the UK for? And you, for those who've waded through 
the, the entirety of the report, you'll see that there are recommendations in there about devolving more power to the nations and regions, as I've said, about guaranteeing certain minimum entitlements in terms of socioeconomic rights, a new mission statement for the UK articulating what it's all for. And so this recommendation around an assembly of the regions and nations is made in that context. Um, we've actually been fairly uh, careful in terms of how prescriptive we've been in our report as to precisely how um, the uh, second chamber that we propose would be elected and exactly how that would uh, reflect the regions and nations. But clearly we've emphasized that and that geographic component is essential to the new constitutional settlement that we propose. But we are very clear um, two things. One, this is something that needs to be consulted on and consulted on widely because it's right that we get it right. But secondly, and I know this touches on previous questions, that this is something that the Labour Party, if it were elected, could deliver within a first term. So we want to have that conversation. We want to have that consultation now. And it's important that it's done so that we can put forward a detailed proposal of exactly how that composition is broken down. We've suggested the sort of numbers of seats that we say should, it should make up. I've mentioned it already, 200. How exactly that's distributed, um, the term length, all of those things is the detail to be worked out and consulted on. But we're very clear that um, our proposals, we think, are, are, are ones that are deliverable within a first-term Labour government if the leader of the opposition uh, wins and chooses to make it a political priority. Um, so. Yes, the devil is in the detail, but it's detail that does need to be worked out in conversation with the public and indeed in, in sort of spaces like this. Um, you know, it, it's important that this is a report that is taken out to the regions and nations, is taken out uh, into think tanks and, and, and academic circles, but also taken out to the public. Um, the other idea, and it builds on what you were saying earlier about deliberative democracy and, and other models that, that we refer to in the report is the idea of a constitutional convention in due course, which is another vehicle um, for looking at these questions. But in terms of the specifics, that's something that we, can be, that we hope can be worked out um, it, it, through the process of consultation on the recommendations in the report. Great, thank you. Um, I'll take some questions from the audience. If you could just uh, put your hands up, there's a roving mic coming round. And if before speaking, you could just um, say who you are and what organisation you're from. So I think we'll go uh, one, two, and then three over there, if that's okay. Hello, uh, my name's Jack Richardson. I'm a freelance journalist. Over the summer, I um, virtually attended an IFG event with, with Sir Robert Buckland, where he suggested that the post of Lord Chancellor ought to be reformed and and not not returned to its pre two thousand and three form, but put but chosen from the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. I just in in the context of any other proposed reforms, I'd be interested to get the panel's view on that. Great, thank you. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, Richard McKeever. Um, I'm with the Embassy of Japan. Um, I was it's just really interesting on the points. Uh, with the Council for the Nations and Regions, uh, do you, as a sort of a generic question, do you believe that these sort of constitutional reforms would be enough to save the union of the United Kingdom, given the direction that Scotland is, could be heading uh, with the referendum uh, polling? Uh, and on that same note, when you say that this second chamber would serve the country, um, do you think that th that definition in itself could cause problems given that country and nation can be perceived differently and for people in Scotland they might see that their country is Scotland and not the United Kingdom and the same for even uh, Plaid Cymru and to some other extent Sinn Féin, not that they would stand. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that those were my overall questions and just to add on to that as well, with the second chamber do you think that it could also experience some forms of political gridlock in that we would see in the American Senate or German style, or even to uh, another extent with the European Council. Um, yeah, thank you. Sorry. Um, hello, uh, my name's Elizabeth. I'm just a member of the public. Um, <laughs> my questions are around public engagement. Um, so for um, Sarah, and I'm so sorry, New Zealand chap, I didn't get your name. Um, but. Um, you spoke a lot about public engagement and the popularity of the proposals to abolish lords. So, first of all, um, if you're requiring people to elect 
a second chamber. You're you're there for you're putting more of a burden on voters to engage with processes that they're not necessarily particularly au fait with outside of general election periods. We already know turnout is really, really low at local elections, um, tragically so in my opinion, because I'm a massive believer in the power of local government. Um, so who do we expect will actually bother to vote at additional elections? And the other question on popularity is um, this... The, the popularity of these proposals seems to be a big driving factor, certainly in how it's been reported. Sarah, you may not think it, it, it is in terms of how it was um, developed, but the death penalty is also very popular. The majority of people in the UK would like to see the death penalty reinstated. So if popularity is an argument, will we see proposals from Labour on that? Great, thanks. Lots of questions in there. Um, so if we can keep answers fairly brief, um, so we might be able to get another round in. But I want to start with the question on the, the Lord Chancellor um, and to come uh, to you on that, Lord Norton. Is, should we have the return of the law lords? Is that the, a reform in the other direction that, that we should be considering? Well, you can't put the genie back in, you can't put it back <laughs> in the bottle. I mean, I, I was against the law lords moving out because there's actually an argument for them uh, being where they were. I mean, they were operated as a distinct entity, but being where they were, I think, actually helped uh, to protect them. And, of course, half the law lords are against the move as well, but they've moved. They're not going to come back. Um, the point I'd make about Lord Chancellor was it shows the problems when you rush reform. Um, and we ended up in a sort of halfway house with the position of Lord Chancellor. So I wouldn't put it back to what it was, um, but, of course, the, um, certainly not to be the presiding officer of the... House. The House now elects its own uh, Lord Speaker to preside. Um, there was merit, though, in having the Lord Chancellor as um, a senior lawyer, and for that matter, being a member of the Lord. So, um, going back to some extent to that, certainly have the Lord Chancellor as I just thought, a senior figure in the law may have some value, whether it goes back, you know, whether it's someone chosen in the Lords rather than automatically. But there's something in that, because the position of the Lord Chancellor, I think, is distinctive. And being the voice of the law in government, I think, has a certain value. So on, on that particular um, question, I, I um, can see merit in revisiting it, perhaps not putting it back. But um, it is the Lord Chancellor's in an unusual position, and I'm not sure one that um, is, as it stands, desirable. Great. Um, Matthew, I wanted to come to you on the question on voter fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, do you, is that a problem that you identified when you were considering this in government? And I suppose sort of related to that, um, having a democratically elected chamber likely would mean more staff, it might mean more costs. Is that something that people would be willing to accept? Um, we did think about these questions. Um, and of course, cost comes back to size. So if you take it down to 200 or 300, then you could potentially square this. I think one of the things we tried to make sure in the coalition proposals was that it would be flat in cost terms. So if you just take out a large number, then that, that can help with that. I think voter fatigue is, is, a, is a tricky question. Um, but even if you had low turnout, you, you still have turnout, yeah? And you still have people who have voted, which bluntly, in my view at least, is a significant improvement on the status quo. Would I like a high, turn high turnout? Yes. Um, and it is for politicians to, you know, have to grapple with that question. Um, and I agree, it's a real shame that we get low turnout in local elections. Um, and I think a lot of this, and they do piece together, is people need to see that elections outside those two, the House of Commons, have value. I mean, at the moment, I don't think they see that at local elections, and there would be a risk that they wouldn't see it um, in, in a second chamber as well. So, yeah, we did grapple with this a lot, um, and there would be a risk, if we're being candid, that the first elections for this chamber, whatever we choose to call it, um, might be a low turnout one. So there is some, you know, there's a dynamic here. I mean, one option, which I read in between the lines, I think is, you know, a, one interpretation of Brown Commission is you go secondary mandate. So you do, Bundesrat style. So you do say, actually, because well, I think, and I suspect we may have agreement on this, that lots of the best current contributors in the House of Lords are local government leaders, i.e. current or former, because they, they have a lot of the experience that we've all been agreeing, I think, is valuable. So if you actually say, well, people have got a, uh, a mandate leading councils across England, um, devolved administrations, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and indeed local government there, 
and you put them in the Lords, either as part of it or all of it. That, that is a way you get around that question, although, of course, those folks might still have low turnout from those elections. But yeah, it, it, it is a big challenge, but ultimately, low turnout is better than no turnout. Great, Sarah, and what about this question? Is this, will this save the union? Is this enough? Hope so. <laughs> um, look, um, it, it, it's, it's important that there's a lot of, there's a lot of terminology, some might say jargon, in the report, Assembly of Nations and Regions, Council of Nations and Regions. All of these things are, are different components that are geared at strengthening the UK. And we say, and, and, and I think it's significant that the chair of our commission was Gordon Brown, and, and, and I think were he here, he would say that this is an attractive option um, an attractive set of proposals, uh, not just to those of us uh, who, who, who are interested in um, the, the principles of constitutional reform at the centre, but an attractive proposition to the peoples of Scotland, Wales, uh, Northern Ireland, and uh, the English regions, which uh, have been for so long a neglected part of the question. And, and I think it is significant. The reason I refer to all those different names is that the Assembly of Nations and Regions, which is what we've titled the Second Chamber, sits within a system where you have strengthened intergovernmental relations. Um, the bringing together of the leaders of the devolved nations and regions through a council, so something that we saw painfully exposed during the pandemic was the lack of coordination, the lack of an effective functioning forum in which those uh, people could be brought together um, to coordinate an effective response. Um, and so it's important that to see, as I think I started in my opening remarks, to see a reform second chamber in that context. But as I said, also an attractive proposition in terms of safeguarding minimum socioeconomic rights and entitlements uh, right across the UK. Um, if, if you like, a, a, a constitutional principle of solidarity um, which embeds the idea of promoting economic uh, equality and reducing inequality right across uh, the United uh, Kingdom. And, and perhaps, you know, the, the most obvious um, lesson uh, from the recent Conservative government's uh, disregard for constitutional convention is in relation to devolution. And the fact that alongside the reform of uh, the Second Chamber, we propose a strengthened uh, version of the Sewell Convention, putting it in, uh, in, in, on statutory footing, in codified form, and sorry to get all kind of legalistic, but the fact that returning to function, we see the uh, function of a reform second chamber as safeguarding that, safeguarding the, the devolution settlement, that people in Scotland, and indeed in Wales and Northern Ireland, can look at that and say, the Assembly of Regions of Nations is safeguarding this thing that we value, um, and, and, and safeguarding the democratic uh, decisions that are being taken on a devolved basis. It's reinforcing that rather than taking away from it. Um, and in that context, with a inspiring mission statement for the UK and the constitutional infrastructure and architecture to support it, we think that is a deal and a proposition which people right across the UK will find attractive and indeed, and I agree with the point made that low turnout is better than no turnout, actually vote for. And if I can just pick up on the point about, you know, um, are we doing this because this is popular? That's the sort of flip side of, 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 of the initial question, which is, well, why are you talking about this in a cost of living crisis? Do I go out on the doorstep knocking on doors talking about House of Lords reform? No, I don't. But I do talk about tackling economic inequality, about the need for restoring trust in our politics. And, you know, we do things because they're right as well as because they're popular. Um, and, and, and that's why we are arguing for uh, a democratically elected reform second chamber. Thanks. Um, Darren, just to pick up on this popularity point, and I'm going to take another question from uh, online from Professor Stephen Newton. Um, one of the things that disappointed some people, perhaps, about the Brown Commission was that uh, one issue in which perhaps there was arguably more pu public pressure for reform on wasn't included, that being electoral reform. It's obviously in the, the name of your organisation. <laughs> um, you know, governments have limited political capital for constitutional reform. Are we focusing on the wrong issue here? 
I'll stand by for my unbiased opinion on the need for the <laughs> House of Commons. No, I mean, I think that the, the Commission, I mean, we would have loved them to have picked that up because I, I think this, this idea that Sarah's just been mentioning of linking economic inequality and economic challenges with political inequality uh, is, is a really interesting frame for us to think about all of these things and provides a, 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 a multiple partisan way of assessing some of these things rather than my side's one, here are the new rules and then the next side comes in and, and they write the next set of rules. I think the voter ID proposals are a great example of, of why you need to have much more sort of thought about how long you want these things to change for. But they, the Brown Commission did say they weren't going to be looking at the uh, at the voting system for the House of Commons. I wasn't surprised it wasn't in there. I certainly welcome the, the, the Lord's proposals. But thankfully, uh, the Labour Party this year and the, the trade union movement have moved a long way on House of Commons reform and wanting to see proportional representation, voting for it at their party conference uh, in September by, by a wide margin. So I think that that issue is certainly on the, uh, on the agenda and, and will be a challenge for uh, Keir Starmer because, uh, again, it's this issue of self-regulating one's own industry. Uh, and, and we've already seen the response of some Labour peers to the idea that they might not be able to stay for life in the, uh, in the second chamber. Uh, and I think that that, would be, that will be an issue for him to battle with with his MPs. But it's, it's worth doing it. It does link into what the, the questioner Elizabeth asked about, uh, about low turnout, and that so many parts of the UK votes just don't count because the way we use our voting system, as soon as the winner wins by one vote, every additional vote doesn't matter. If you vote for a losing candidate, your vote is a dead end, it goes nowhere. In local government, there are lots of what we call one-party states where there's such total party domination. If you support that party, if you miss your vote, it's not the end of the world. If you don't support that party, other than extreme civic duty uh, and maybe a badge or a sticker, free cup of tea if, uh, if you're in Australia, um, uh, then, then it's uh, difficult to see why your vote would matter. So I think being able to demonstrate political outcomes for your vote and then things happening that are attached to what you, the way you see the world uh, is a way of engaging vote, voter, voter turnout much more solidly than, than we've seen. And so I think that this issue of PR for the Commons is absolutely um, not going to go away and it's going to be an issue for Labour whether they win extremely big as some people think right now sitting here at the end of 2022 uh, because we've seen what happens with excessively large Labour government. Uh, and, and then also if, if it's a minority government and they have to start learning to talk to other parties about piecing together uh, a programme for government. So these, if, if you're interested in all of these topics, this is an extremely exciting time and we've just got to make sure we get across the finish line with some, some real, really meaningful change. Fantastic. I feel like we could continue this discussion for another hour, but unfortunately, Darren's got to get to the ERS Christmas lunch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they've already had their starters. Um, <laughs> great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining me. Please do check out the work of the Institute for Government and Bennett Institute Review of the UK Constitution. Uh, we'll be pub publishing our own original research, including a paper on reforming the legislative process um, that came out last week. If you think uh, the process of legislative scrutiny in the Commons isn't good enough. We have some ideas about how you might improve that. Um, and we've also got guest papers from leading academics and experts, including one by Robert Hazel on the future of the future challenges for the monarchy coming out tomorrow. Um, this event will be up to watch on YouTube in the next few days. Um, and if you enjoyed it, you can join us for future IFG events, including one on Thursday on how can the government strengthen the UK's resilience with Oliver Letwin and Fleur Anderson. And MPs. Um, all that remains for me to do then is to thank our excellent panel. Thank you to Matthew Hannay, Darren Hughes, Lord Norton, and Sarah Sackman. And thank you all for tuning in.